Hey everyone, my name is Jared, and we're going to go ahead and spend some time worshiping together. Awake from your sleep, arise from the dead, Christ will give us light. He will lift our hands, turn to Him in song. Awake in the dawn, awake from your sleep. Awake from your sleep, it's nearer than before. Salvation is sin, He's knocking at our door. Turn to him in song. Awake in the dawn. God knows. God knows all we want to do is sing. Till there's nothing left to bring. To the seat of grace we climb. Step by step through these difficult times. God knows all we want to do is sing. Till there's nothing left to bring To the seat of grace we climb Step by step in these difficult times Awake from your sleep Arise from the dead everyone, I'm Shelley Sazanoff and I'm coming to you from my studio, my home. Hope you're all doing well this morning. Um, I have the pleasure of reading um, the scripture passage this morning and it's 1 John 3, 4 through 10. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you for who you are, God. We thank you for your love and your mercy in our lives, God. We thank you for your justice and your righteousness. We just pray that our hearts would hear these words, God. We pray that our hearts would desire to be righteous as you are righteous, Lord. Um, we pray for um, your love um, to just overflow in our hearts, God, and that flow would just um, seep out to all those around us, God. We thank you for changing us and making us new each day, Lord, and um, help us to have open hearts to hear um, your words this morning and to meditate on them throughout this week. Thank you so much for this time, for this community, um, just gathering in different places um, or in their homes, God. Um, just bless each person. Um, help us to live out your truth. In your name we pray, amen. All right, well, this is a stupid opening illustration, but it's the one I have. Uh, in the 90s movie, Billy Madison, <laughs> Uh, if you recall, there were, there were a few characters who, who would repeatedly bully little Billy. Um, and uh, almost every time something would happen, he'd get something dumped on his head, he'd have trash stuffed in his locker or whatever. There would be this universal refrain. I'm betting someone did it. O'Doyle oh, rules. And throughout the movie, we get from elementary school kids up through high school kids, they, the bullies kind of look the same and they kind of do the same thing and then we, it kind of culminates in this scene with uh, all the kids and the dad in the car um, and the dad is just like chanting O'Doyle rules at them as all the kids are chanting it back and you, you get this picture of this, this family identity that is pretty weird 
pretty bizarre, uh, and frankly, a stupid sermon illustration. But it actually is kind of like this really succinct little emblematic thing that kind of captures a little bit of what Josh talked about last week and what is definitely coming back up this week, which is like family identity and the power of uh, of a family shaping sort of the narrative of someone's life. Um, these kids look alike, they sound alike, they act alike, they have the same values, and they're representing very clearly the wishes of their father uh, in this case. Uh, it just happens to be for pretty stupid ends in that case. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, this week we, we continue to explore this idea of what it means to be a child of God or part of the family of God. And if last week was about understanding ourselves just just and the power and the beauty and, and, and the motivation of that um, as children of God, then this week kind of moves into how holding that title, child of God, carries the responsibility of representing that family well, to actually look as though you are part of that family, to do the things that the Father is asking of you. And in the text that we just had read for us, uh, we see kind of these two really strong parallel paths set up. Um, we could even call them the, the, the children of two different fathers or the children of two families. First, we see reference to the children of God, continued from last week. And in this today's text, where we see that they are those who don't continue sinning, those who practice righteousness, those who love the brother contrasted sharply with them is the children of the devil. And I don't know if you have ever been called a child of the devil, uh, but I, I, I believe this is what they call fighting words. Um, it's intense. It's an intense claim. And he says, John says that those are the ones who do continue sinning or do not practice righteousness or do not love the brother or the sister in Christ. And so he's set very parallel terms side by side to see there are these two opposing camps, and he doesn't really allow any middle ground between the two. And as you read this, um, or even listened to it this morning, I, I, it raises the question, and maybe some of you were kind of pricked by this and the thought came to mind, but is this text suggesting that, that a requirement for sort of faithfully living the Christian life is sinless perfection? Is this a perfectionistic text here? Is this what John means when he says, quote, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Is that what he means? Sinless perfectionism? Does this nullify grace? I don't think so. But it's a fair question to ask, and what we need to ask if we're going to honestly wrestle through this passage. And I say no for, for a few reasons. One is that John has already ruled out this possibility earlier in this very letter. 1 John 1.8 1, says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John 2, 1, I'm writing these. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous. Stepping outside of John's writings, we could think of Paul in Romans 7, just lamenting the fact that he finds himself still wrestling with sin. He says, For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. However advanced Paul has gotten in his Christian faith, sin still has a hold in him, dwelling in him, he says. And we have to note, like, a time of sinless perfection actually is coming. It, it actually is, in fact, promised to everyone who is in Christ. And this is monumentously good news because what that means is that all the matters and, and the heart postures that actually amount to every bit of evil and sin and injustice in our world are going to be purged from you and from me and from the rest of the world. That's the beauty of the new creation that Jesus promises. And even John alluded to this last week uh, in, in that passage when he wrote, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him 
that's a promise I hope you cling to and hope that you believe and that you see it as one of the most exciting things possible. Life in God's good world where we're not messing it up with our own sin. But this is later, not the here and now. Not the here and now. So sinless perfectionism is something that's promised in, in, in the future. It's not something that's part of life in this time, <laughs> in this age in which we live. So I, I want you to hear, salvation is by the grace of God alone, through faith in Christ alone. And you are going to need that same grace on your 40th year of following after Jesus and more and more submitting your life to him, just as much as you're going to need that grace the first day you meet Jesus. Grace is always <laughs> the means by which we can approach God. We'll never earn that right. We'll never be good enough. We'll never be just enough. We'll never be perfect enough. But he loves us nonetheless. And he offers grace and mercy. And that's good news too. So what then is going on in this passage? If it's not flatly be perfect if you want to be a real Christian right now. Well, we have to remember, and we brought this up a few times, but we have to remember again, very importantly right now, that, that this letter didn't arrive at its original reader's house from a vacuum. Um, John was motivated to write because of very specific circumstances facing this community. And uh, the Bible Project, at coincidentally right now, is doing a really amazing series uh, through, through the New Testament letters that's kind of exploring this idea and how to read the letters in such a way where we can pick up the context clues that allow us to kind of reconstruct what was going on that motivated the biblical authors to write this way. So check out Bible Project. That's, that's a good resource. But this is a great example of why that skill is an important one to develop. Because again, John has this group of people who had left the authentic Christian faith that the apostles had passed down. And they're claiming some sort of special, secret, insider, better relationship with God. Claiming that John's followers don't have this. Um, and, and not only are they claiming that, they're trying to actively deceive and draw away people from the historic, genuine apostolic faith to whatever this thing is that they're preaching. So John has harsh words for them. Through the letter, he calls them deceivers. A couple weeks ago, we read he called them antichrists. He calls them false prophets. And in this passage, he calls them children of the devil. <laughs> Again, fighting words. So, John didn't leave us any sort of like neat summary of everything that they believed, like sy systematically. So we have to allow the context clues of this letter to piece together. What were these people teaching? Well, already we've seen that they were probably claiming to be sinless. They evidently rejected the commands of God, especially the call to love one's brother or sister. They were apparently lovers of the world, conformists to the world's values rather than to the kingdom's values. Um, they denied that Jesus was the Messiah who had come in the flesh, denying the incarnation, apparently. And now we see again implied that they're refusing to acknowledge and repent of their own sin. They're just continuing on in it as if it doesn't matter. And before we, before we throw too harsh of a light on these guys, I think it's really important to pause we can be self-righteous Bible readers when we read sort of the opponents or especially like the Pharisees. It's easy for us to take on a posture that assumes that, oh, these guys are just so awful, so evidently awful. And I would never respond that way to Jesus or to the apostles. Um, but I, I really want to pause and note that like, if we're honest, if we're honest about it, the, this sort of refusing to acknowledge and repent of sin is something that, that we do too. I certainly do. I get convicted of it. For most of us who identify as Christians, though, we're, we're, we're probably not. I'm assuming you're probably not saying things outright like, it doesn't matter what I do, or I have no sin to acknowledge, or I can live however I want. Probably you're not saying that. If you are saying that, this would be a good passage to read. Um, but... Uh, for many of us, where this does come out, the same heart and the same spirit comes out is in our selectivity with sin. Our selectivity with sin. Um, 
So uh, for an example, uh, many of us find ourselves really easily motivated to join like kind of public calls for justice, um, which I, I hope I hope anytime you hear the word justice, you'll you'll be able to fill in that content uh, from a biblical worldview, and namely the fact that a call for justice is actually fundamentally a call to see sin dealt with properly, both in stopping the harm that it causes and in making restitution for the harm that it has caused. Uh, a call for justice is really a call to see sin dealt with. That's why Christians must always be people of justice. We, we, I hope and pray that we can be known as people who yearn for justice and work for justice practically. Um, but my point is, when we see these calls for justice, which are really calls to see sin dealt with, that are popular or culturally ascendant or trendy or, or so on, we go, yeah, I want to get, get in on that. And honestly, if the call is truly a reflection of God's heart, uh, if, if it is uh, aligned with God's vision of justice, like a call for racial equality, um, then I, I'm going to applaud that desire regardless of what's motivating it. Like, we'll, we'll take it. We'll take it. But if you're like me, um, I'm, I'm assuming there are probably at least a handful of issues that God also really seems to care about um, that we are often silent on. Um, for some of them, we'll rationalize them away. Try to twist the scripture so that it doesn't say what it says. Uh, for some of us, we might just stay willfully ignorant of them. Um, and, and there are probably other things we do with them too when they make us uncomfortable. But the, this can be true of both the big sort of national cultural sin issues, um, but also true of small, intimate, personal, individualistic, seemingly sin issues. For Jesus, they both matter. The big and systemic and the small and personal, they both matter uh, because he came, this passage tells us, to take away sin and to destroy the works of the devil wherever they're found. And so, so whether in the big or in the small corners of your heart, Jesus is righteously, lovingly against sin. That's part of why he is the good king. My question is, are you? Are you righteously, lovingly against sin wherever you see it, whether it gets you cultural points to be against it or whether it earns you cultural ostracism to be against it? Whether it's something that can be seen and get congratulations on social media or whether it's something that's only known by you and the Lord in the privacy of, of your home. Um, do you think that what you do matters? Anyway, the believers who John so deeply loves are either being drawn away into this mess uh, believing these weird things that they're putting forward, or they're beginning to struggle with massive doubts about, man, do I actually have the real truth? Do I have the sincere truth? They're, they're insecure, which is why John keeps offering them encouragement again and again. And so, to wrap up, facing off with this group, uh, John is going to use this very intense, incredibly pointed confrontational language to point out the absolute contrast between what these people are doing these false teachers, and what the true, true children of God do. And he's going to paint it in the starkest terms, in absolute contrast, uh, both to encourage those who've been faithful and to challenge those who are bringing this, this false message. Um, so John's point here um, is that in the face of people, who are claiming that what they do tangibly with their lives doesn't matter is to say that it matters <laughs> and it matters more than you could possibly imagine. And it's the clearest evidence, one of the clearest evidences of who actually knows and trusts and follows the real Jesus. 
John, to use a, another kind of stupid phrase, John seems to be saying the proof is in the pudding. You, you look at the fruit of someone's life. It's meaningful to do so. And I don't think John wants to undermine the doctrine of grace, but he's answering a different question right now. The question he's trying to answer in this circumstance isn't, how does someone enter a saving relationship with Jesus? Or even, by what mechanism is someone saved? The question that he's actually answering right now is something more like, does how we live actually matter? And the answer is yes. And we see the logic of this in the rest of the text. It, it's the logic of the family resemblance, like we've already talked about. So, so the fact that we are a family and have this connection is evident. Verse 3-1 last week, we've been declared God's children. Verse 9 this week, God's seed is in us. It's meant to blossom and bloom and grow out uh, into something that looks like him. Verse 9 as well, we've been born of God, birthing language, familial language. And that's our connection. And then what does it say about him? It says, well, he appeared to take away sin, verse 5. In him there is no sin, verse 5. He is righteous, verse 7. He appeared to destroy the works of the devil, verse 8. And then we see uh, our fruit by implication is that we are thus to look like him. And he says, practicing righteousness and loving the brother and the sister in verse 10. And so because we are in his family, we have an obligation to look like his family. And as for a final movement here, just a few minutes, I, I want you to see that this isn't some one-off kind of harsh teaching of John. This very much tracks with the overall, overall overarching story of what God is up to with his people through the whole Bible. So in Genesis 128, following the creation of humanity, male and female, God gave them their chief task. Let's read it. Genesis 1:27 says, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And it goes on, but... But the point for now is that at the inauguration of creation, which has a nice ring to it, God's image bearers are to fill the earth with more image bearers, and thus with the glory of God ruling and cultivating on God's behalf. Theologians call this the cultural mandate given to humanity, or we could think of it as the first great commission. God left humans to rule in his place as his representatives and to take the world, which is never described as perfect in Genesis 1. It's fully good, but it actually had room to grow and to be cultivated and to improve, and humans were left that task. It's beautiful. But of course, by Genesis 3, uh, humanity's fallen into sin. They've decided to define good and evil for themselves. They've rebelled against God. Uh, and now, as they're still going to continue to multiply and spread, because, let's be honest, humans do that, um, in part, that multiplication is going to mean the spread of sin and evil and sickness and death and rebellion all across the world. It doesn't mean the image of God's been lost. It hasn't but it's been marred and distorted. So there is good and beauty going out with humanity, but at the same time, there is sin and evil going out with humanity. And those things will always be mixed together. Later, God chooses Abraham, tells him he's going to be the father of a great family that's going to bless the whole world. This family is going to be blessed to be a blessing to the whole world. Even later than that, from that family, God chooses Moses and uses him to rescue the family out of slavery in Egypt. He liberates them and gives them not just a family identity once again, but now a national identity. Uh, again, blessed to be a blessing, but set apart, distinct, but invitational to invite people to come and see what God is like and to worship him. Um, to see the nations come into relationship with God. And then even later than that, the nation... Uh, actually gets to become a kingdom 
that God promised would last forever with a rightful king in the, in the line of David who would rule justly and perfectly, foreshadowing Jesus, of course. Um, that, and this king would rule in such a way as to be a beacon of God's goodness out into the world. Once again, an invitation to come and see and worship. But through each of these developments of God entrusting human representatives in the world, sin sin continues and continued. Um, sin's fatally mixed in and, and the beautiful role that God's people were supposed to play in each area becomes muddled and actually becomes surrendered as they choose sin, as they choose to oppress, as they choose to do violence, as they choose to embrace idolatry and on and on and on and on. They surrender it. Um, and so, it's incredibly significant that in Matthew 28, the resurrected Jesus, the first fruits of the new creation, brings a new great commission to once again spread the good news to every corner of the earth uh, about God's rule and about how to come be a part of this new humanity, how to be saved, how to be welcomed into the family. And this new humanity is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God it's given a new heart, and it's able to, once again, faithfully, ideally, represent him in the world like they couldn't before without the Holy Spirit and without this new heart. So here's my point. That's the story. My point is, our lives as Christians, even today in the year 2020, are part of God's overarching plan to lovingly cultivate his creation to represent him and his purposes, to, to serve as his co-rulers, to draw people into the same program and to make visible to the world what he's like. And so if that is what we are for, that's what we were designed to be and do. What we do matters. It matters. This does not mean that we have a, a, a need for perfection that replaces grace. But it does mean that as God's ambassadors, that's the language Paul uses, we are not free to defame his name as agents of sin and evil and injustice and death in the world. At our best, motivated by his loving mercy, his death for our sins, indwelled with his spirit, we are to image him, represent him, declare him as faithfully as we can. To do it as much as possible without hypocrisy and without defaming him before the world. We'll do that and there will be grace for that. But we should be striving to honor him as his representatives. So I like this quote from Gary Burge in his commentary, he says, The assumption throughout is that John's audience is born of God, that they enjoyed a redeemed place with the Father. In light of that privilege, sin should have no place. Holiness becomes an imperative fuel, not by fear of jeopardy. That's important. It's fueled not by fear of jeopardy, but by a heartfelt response to the security that God's love gives us. Cosmetic changes appear in our lives in response to threats. Permanent change comes to us when we are safe and assured in God's love. This safety must be anchored in the objective work of Christ on the cross. I think that's true. So to finish, I just want to return to the words of 1 John 2.1. I've already quoted it here in this sermon. I want to do it again because I think it it captures so much of the heart what's in this, of what's in this passage. Hopefully now we can read it with a little more insight. It says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen.
giving me hope, you're giving me hope in a dying world. Oh, my love, you're giving me life, you are the rock on which I stand. All my days, I sing to your praises. Sing to your praises with every breath. Fix my gaze on the one who saves us, the one who saves us even from death. dying world Oh my love You're giving me life You are the rock on which I stand All my days I sing to your praises I sing to your praises with every breath Fix my gaze on the one who saves us, on the one who saves us, even from death.